Let's rank all 61 episodes of Avatar The Last Airbender from worst to best. Number 61, The Great Divide. Was there any doubt this was the worst episode in the series? My largest issue with this episode is that it's the only one in the entire series I would truly classify as filler. None of the characters in this episode get any development. The people in the two tribes we meet never show up again, and the only other time the Great Divide is mentioned is through a passing joke in the Ember Island Players episode. I guess the only relevance this episode has is Aang learning his role as a peacekeeper too? The Avatar does have a lot of responsibilities, and one of those is is keeping the peace between feuding factions, but I feel like Aang does that many other times throughout the series, so it wasn't entirely necessary here. The action in this episode was fine, I guess, nothing special. There's just not a single good takeaway from this episode. I don't want to over-exaggerate and say this is the worst episode of TV I have ever seen because it's not, but considering Avatar The Last Airbender is held to such a high standard, this episode easily becomes the worst of the series. Number 60, The Fortune Teller. This is another episode you can kinda argue is filler. Basically, the gang runs into a fortune teller, hence the name of the episode, and they listen to fortunes. Pretty much all that happens here is Aang and Katara are obsessed with their futures. Katara wants to know about her future husband, and Aang wants to know if he will end up with Katara. I don't really know the point of this episode. It seems like all they wanted to accomplish was to convey to the audience how much of a crush Aang has on Katara, and that's it. I'm glad Aang's feelings for Katara aren't a major part of this series. I mean, sure, it's a plot point that's brought up here and there, but it's never a major part of the story. I am curious to see if Katara's fortune of having three great-grandchildren before she dies will become true in the future stories. Besides that, this episode didn't have any action, but it did have some funny moments with Sokka. The way he was getting frustrated with Aunt Wu was kind of funny. This was not a good episode by any means, but I wouldn't say it was bad like The Great Divide. It's pretty much filler, though. Number 59, The King of Omashu. This episode was, eh. On the positive side, the world building of Omashu was really cool. This was the first time in the series we saw earthbending, and seeing how the city uses earthbending to open doors and move the carts was a really neat way to make the world feel real. Also, Bumi is quite the character. He doesn't appear much, but when he does, he is quite funny. My biggest criticism of the episode is Bumi's challenges for Aang. Sure, they lead to some pretty neat action sequences, but narratively, they serve no purpose at all. It was just a way for Aang to remember Bumi's name and the way Aang was supposed to remember it was far-fetched. Even when Sokka asks Bumi why he makes Aang do all these challenges, Bumi just gives a generic answer and says Aang must learn all the elements and fight the Fire Lord. How that has to tie into the challenges, I have no idea. I wasn't a big fan of the humor in this episode, like Aang pretending to be an old man. Listen, I'm not trying to be too critical, I get this is a kid's show, but there's just a way to write child humor other than making certain characters seem stupid. And these Earth Kingdom guards are idiots, but that's the only minor complaint. Complaint. Considering Avatar has so many great episodes, it leaves the King of Omashu near the bottom of the list. Number 58, Imprisoned. This was a more Katara-focused episode, and it showed us her incredible heart. She always fights for what's right, and it's one of her most admirable qualities. While the episode did do a decent job at highlighting Katara, the plot of the episode was just meh. This isn't exclusive to Avatar. It's in tons of animated shows, but I'm never a big fan of prison escape plots, especially when it's so easy. Overall, this show does a great job at making the Fire Nation feel like a formidable threat, but episodes like this one make them seem weak. When it comes to the characters, Haru isn't a big part of the series, and we didn't learn much about him as a supporting character anyway. What this episode did do well was world building. Again, Avatar managed to weave in mature themes like prisoners of war and imperialism and abuse of power. I also really like the concept of an earthbender prison that doesn't allow any earthbenders to bend. It's a neat and realistic idea. So while this episode did have some cool things going for it, overall it's a pretty forgettable one in the first season. Number 57, The Swamp. This was not a great episode. The gang flies over a swamp and they get attacked by a tornado and are forced to fight. Momo and Appa get separated and end up having to fight some swamp benders. With Aang, Katara, and Sokka, they end up having some weird visions and then they fight a giant swamp monster which really ends up being another swamp bender. The only thing Aang learned in this episode was how to read the vines to see across the swamp. Something like that is never again displayed throughout the series. Some complaints I can give this episode are some of the fight sequences 
sequences. Seeing Katara and Aang waterbend in a unique way was pretty cool, but my biggest positive for the episode was the introduction to swamp bending. What the show does really well is expand the four kinds of bending in ways that just make sense. These vines are full of water, so of course you can waterbend them, and seeing these swamp people just live on their own was pretty cool. Besides the nice stuff this episode does for the world building of the universe, a lot of it was pretty forgettable and was not that important in the grand scheme of things. Number 56, The Deserter. This episode has a few cool things, but overall it's just fine. The episode begins with this Fire Nation town, and I actually quite liked that. This series has done a good job of showing all these different towns, but it got a little repetitive with all these Earth Kingdom places. Here we get a bit more diversity on that front with a Fire Nation town. The main plot of this episode is meeting Zhang Zhang. I've always found Zhang Zhang's view of firebending to be quite interesting when comparing it to, say, the Sun Warriors in Season 3. Zhang Zhang sees fire as destruction and pain, while the Sun Warriors see it as life and energy. It makes sense though considering John John was once a Fire Nation general. He would view firebending as destruction. The biggest takeaway from this episode however was Aang accidentally burning Katara. This moment becomes crucial later on when Aang needs to learn firebending from Zuko. Aang learning the importance of restraint and caution with firebending is a big part of his journey, so I like that. Besides those few things I liked here and there, the rest of the episode was just meh. Seeing Zhao fight Aang was cool, I guess, but overall this was just an okay episode. Number 55, The Awakening. Season 3 had a pretty slow start to the season. The entire episode is pretty much Aang waking up and struggling with the perception of him being dead. It matters a lot to Aang that he doesn't abandon people again, so I totally get his frustrations with pretending to be dead. But that's all there is to this episode. I would have liked maybe an action beat or something else that goes along with the struggle Aang is dealing with. Like with the beginning of Season 2, Aang was struggling with the Avatar state and then that one Earth Kingdom guy was testing him. That was a great way to tie Aang's struggles in with some external fighting. So I I wish this episode was like that. We also get Zuko's return to the Fire Nation in this episode, and that was pretty cool. We can tell early on that this victory just doesn't feel right to him. Also, Azula's plan of giving Zuko the credit for supposedly killing the Avatar was genius. That is the stuff from Azula I love. But besides a few character moments that I found to be intriguing, this episode was quite boring and didn't do much for me. Number 54, The Siege of the North Part 2. This might be a hot take, but I don't really like this battle. I wouldn't say it's bad, but it wasn't really engaging. There was some cool stuff with the spirit world. The mystery behind the spirits and the spirit world itself is some of my favorite stuff in Avatar. I also found Zuko to be a highlight in this episode. I liked the little monologue he gave to Aang about never giving up and how he doesn't need luck. It's a moment that gave him more depth. The action is fine. I liked seeing a lot of the waterbenders and their fights with the firebenders. I would say the reason this episode is so low on my list is because of the contrivances the episode has. So the Moon Spirit dies, but conveniently Yue can give her life to save the Moon Spirit because the Moon Spirit saved her. Sure, I guess. And all episode Aang is trying to find answers from the Moon and Ocean Spirits, and right after the Moon Spirit dies, it just decides to grant Aang with God Mode powers to defeat the entire Fire Nation fleet. Some of this may feel right to you, and that's awesome, but to me it feels like a cheap way to conclude the battle. Although I enjoyed parts of this episode, as a whole I didn't find it to be an engaging episode. And as a season finale, I kinda hold that to a higher standard. Number 53, The Northern Air Temple. This episode is an interesting one to me because I disagree with its message. So Aang and company go to the Northern Air Temple where they find refugees. The refugees have turned the temple into their new home, but in doing so have destroyed a lot of what was once part of the temple. Aang is initially furious that these people are destroying part of his culture, but by the end of the episode he's okay with it because these people needed a new home. I get the message here, but I'm mostly with Aang at the beginning of the episode. These people can still live in the Air Temple fine without having to destroy many of the sacred parts of the temple. Like earlier in the episode, the mechanist casually destroys a statue without any regard for it. I get the vibe that a lot of these people don't have any respect for the temples. Now I wouldn't say my whole disagreement is a criticism of this episode, it's just my perspective on it. The rest of the episode was fine. I liked seeing Sokka's creative mind put to work and creating the hot air balloon. I also did like seeing a lot of the refugees here learning how to fly with gliders. The action at the end of the episode was okay. I didn't hate it, but I didn't love it. This episode poses an interesting moral dilemma and had some decent action, so that's why it's not super high on my list. Number 52, The Siege of the North Part 1. 
Some people may criticize my decision to separate the two-part episodes into two parts, but since the show considers each part two separate chapters, I'm going to rank them as two separate episodes. Not much really happens in this episode. The battle begins and Aang feels overwhelmed, so he decides to seek out the spirits. I did really like the moment where Yue tells Aang that he has to defeat the fleet because he's the Avatar, but Aang responds by saying he's just one kid. Moments like that continue to humanize Aang. There's a touching moment between Iroh and Zuko where Iroh tells him he sees him as a son. The bond between these two is my favorite in the show, so I loved that moment. The reason though this episode is lower on my list is because of the Sokka and Yue stuff. I don't like Yue. She doesn't have any personality to her other than being wishy-washy with Sokka. One moment she's having fun, the next she's telling Sokka she's engaged and can't see him anymore. I get she's a kid, but I didn't find the whole romance between her and Sokka to be interesting. Overall, it's a fine first part of the battle, but it was mostly dragged down by the Sokka and Yue subplot. Number 51, The Warriors of Kiyoshi. This was a fine episode, so the gang goes to Kyoshi Island where we meet Suki and the other Kyoshi warriors. Half of the episode has this neat arc of Sokka learning to respect girls. Sure, you can say it's a little cliche, but Sokka's whole arc throughout the series is about learning to become a leader, and he has to accomplish that slowly over time. So overcoming the prejudices he has about women is important, and frankly, it's realistic for the time. The other half of this episode was about how being the Avatar was getting to Aang's head. At first, I wasn't a big fan of this, but I liked how they had this little flaw of Aang's payoff with him realizing the consequences of him being comfortable in a place like this. Wherever he goes, the Fire Nation will be after him. Aang has to learn that danger follows him and he needs to be responsible. Considering Aang is only a 12-year-old boy, this is a realistic thing a kid would have to learn. The episode ends with some fine action, so no complaints there. Again, considering Avatar is such a great show, some episodes that are just fine are going to be lower on this list because so many episodes are great, and the Warriors of Kiyoshi is is one of those episodes. Number 50, Return to Omashu. There wasn't much to love about this episode, but I didn't hate it. The highlights of this episode are the introduction of Tai Li and Mei. I just love the concept of the main villain of the season having two best friends join her. Considering they're all teenage girls too, it makes the dynamic that much more interesting. Mei is the grumpy, emotionless girl, and Tai Li is the exact opposite in pretty much every way. I also kinda liked the fight sequences near the end of the episode. It was cool seeing Aang and Azula fight on the slides introduced from season 1. When it comes to the plot of the episode, I didn't find it to be too intriguing. Aang wants to find Boomy, but in the meantime he runs into the Resistance, and the way they all escape is by pretending to be sick? I don't know, it just seemed a little too juvenile for me. When Aang wants to free Boomy, he gives some weird speech about knowing when to strike. Sure, whatever. The positives of this episode were pretty good, but the negatives didn't do anything for me. Number 49, Bato of the Water Tribe. This is one of the rare instances where an episode of Avatar has a lot of things I like and a lot of things I don't like. Starting off with the positives, I really liked seeing a bit more of the Water Tribe culture. In the first two episodes, we basically just see a bunch of igloos. Here, we see a lot more than that. I also really loved the stuff with Sokka. The flashbacks to him and his father are such an important part of Sokka's character, so I appreciated that. Also, the sailing rite of passage thing that Sokka led was another cool bit of world building. Moving on from that, the action at the end of the episode was great as well. I believe this is the first time we got to see Appa fight in the series, and it's another example of how creative the writers can be with the action. Also, the fight between Aang and Zuko had some really neat choreography. Moving on to the negatives, the whole part about Aang taking the map bothered me. I get Aang is a kid who is flawed and doesn't want to see his friends leave, but this just doesn't seem like something Aang would do. And when Sokka and Katara find out, I can get them being mad, but agreeing to leave Aang behind was just way too much way too quick. They did turn it around quickly, so it wasn't too much of an issue, but I still didn't like that moment. The positives of this episode contain some of my favorite stuff in season 1, but the negatives contain some of my least favorite stuff. Number 48, The Western Air Temple. This is the episode that immediately follows the invasion, and not much happens. Pretty much the entire premise of the episode is Zuko convincing the gang to let him join them. It was entertaining seeing Zuko be awkward, especially when he was talking to that damn frog. I liked his little speech at the end that he gave to Aang. It does show how much he has changed, instead of him just saying he has changed over and over again. I did like the introduction of the Western Air Temple. I found the design to be quite unique, and given the Airbender's abilities, it totally makes sense. Besides that, there wasn't really anything else here besides a few entertaining exchanges. There was a brief action sequence where they defeated the Combustion Bender, so at least the episode wasn't a total slog. This episode just needed to exist so we could get the Zuko Adventure episodes later on, and the episode did its job. 
Number 47, Avatar Day. This is one of the episodes I would argue doesn't do anything great, but it does a lot of things really well and overall was just a really fun episode. So the gang goes to a village where they hate the Avatar because Kyoshi supposedly killed their leader hundreds of years ago. Sokka and Katara in the meantime try to prove Aang's innocence. I loved Sokka in this episode. For someone who is the only non-bender of Team Avatar, the show does a great job of making Sokka still feel important to the group. And even though his detective abilities are kind of played off as a joke, he does do a pretty good job at solving the case. This episode further progressed Sokka down his arc of becoming the leader he is by the end of season 3. Again, even though the episode doesn't take it too seriously, I still see it as character development. This episode also did some solid world building with Kyoshi, even though it was brief. This was the first time we got to see the power of a fully trained avatar. It gives us a glimpse of what Aang can truly become. The episode had some Zuko and Ira moments as well, and even though it's not much, they did do a good job of establishing what kind of mental state Zuko is in right now. Besides that, this episode episode again was just really fun. I thought there was some well-timed humor, and the whole plot of the episode, as ridiculous as it was, was enjoyable to watch. Again, this episode was nothing special, but it was fun, and I liked it. Number 46, The Painted Lady. This episode was a decent Qatar episode with some cool world building, so the gang comes across this town that is suffering because of the nearby factory. For one, the world building in this episode is subtle but effective. We've seen how technologically the Fire Nation is the most advanced of the civilizations in the world, but in order to be that you need to have factories. I love how Avatar explores the consequences of that with this small village suffering. It's perfectly in line with how we see the Fire Nation treat the environment before, and it gives us another reason to root against them. When it comes to Qatar in this episode, I loved her pretending to be the Painted Lady. One of the most endearing qualities of Katara is her heart, and here that pretty much shines through in every way. I don't really have anything negative to say about this episode. It's a fine episode that has some good character building with Katara, and some neat world building as well. But there's nothing here that stands out that makes me love the episode. Number 45, The Boiling Rock Part 1. This may be a hot take, but I'm not the biggest fan of the Boiling Rock episodes. It's not terrible, but considering Avatar has so many great episodes, it's in the lower echelon of my list. On a positive note, I love Sokka in this episode. I like how he takes responsibility for the defeat during the invasion. Whether it's his fault or not they lost the battle, since it was his idea, he feels responsible, and that's the sign of a good leader. I also like how this episode continues on with the Zuko adventures, with him spending it with Sokka this time after going to the Sun Warriors with Aang. This episode also shows showcases Sokka's creative mind again with him using the cooler as a makeshift boat. So while the episode has some good stuff in it, the reason it's not my favorite is because in general I hate prison escape episodes as I said earlier. I find them to be way too easy for our heroes and everything always goes their way. This is supposedly the most secure Fire Nation prison but Zuko and Sokka seem to infiltrate it relatively easily and this criticism definitely continues on into part 2. Number 44, The Boiling Rock Part 2. Starting off with the positives, I still do like a lot of the character work here. I love the moments between Mei, Tai Li, and Azula. This moment here was the beginning of Azula's downfall, and I love how it stems from her friends betraying her. Also, the whole fight sequences on the gondola were really well choreographed. But following in the footsteps of my criticisms from part 1, the escape was just way too easy. I get that Tsuki is a Kyoshi warrior who is clearly a trained fighter, but the sequence where she escapes and captures the warden is one of the few times my suspension of disbelief was broken. She manages to do some Spider-Man type shit, and of course our heroes are all about to die, but Mei magically breaks from the jail cell and sets them free. I just wish there was a bit more of a challenge escaping from the supposed most secure Fire Nation prison. While these episodes were entertaining and did have some good character work, overall I was disappointed with how easy the whole missions were. Number 43, The Runaway. At this point in the third season, I started to notice a trend with the first half of the season. Before the Black Sun invasion, a lot of these episodes are just character focus episodes. Plot wise, nothing really happens between the beginning of the season and the invasion, but the writers needed to put 8 episodes between the two. So The Runaway is another example of a fine episode that has good character work, but makes no attempt to advance the plot. I really like the stuff between Toph and Katara in this episode. Seeing their personalities clash was entertaining, and I liked the little arc the two went on together. Again, this episode like a lot of the episodes in the first half of season 3 are just that, good character focused episodes. The first half of season 2 accomplished quite a bit narratively, and I wish season 3 did the same. Either way, this is a minor criticism, because the writers of Avatar had mastered turning potential filler episodes into episodes with depth. The Runaway may not be the best side episode in the series, but it was good enough for me to enjoy it. Number 42, The Library. 
This episode had some cool stuff in it. So Sokka suggests that they all need to take a trip to a special library in the desert so they can gain information on the Fire Nation. What I like the most about this episode is that it gave the rest of the season direction. For the first few episodes of the season, they needed to find an earthbending teacher. Now that they have Toph, they now need a new direction. After finding out when the next solar eclipse is, they now must get that information to the Earth Kingdom. Boom, direction. Also, the whole idea of a solar eclipse limiting the firebenders' firebending is another brilliant idea. This episode has a whole has some really neat ideas and sets up the rest of the season nicely too, like with Appa getting captured. When it comes to the contents of the actual episode, it was fine. I liked the mysterious nature of the library and its inhabitants. I also liked the professor, but besides that, there wasn't much there in this episode. They go to the library, they are forced to escape, and Sokka gets the date of the solar eclipse. There wasn't much character work in the episode, and there didn't need to be. Overall, this was a solid episode that while not having much substance to it, did do a great job at setting up the rest of the season. Number 41, Winter Solstice Part 2. This episode has the gang traveling to the Fire Nation for the first time, even if it's just an island. The episode did a lot to add urgency to the series. Aang not only needs to master all the elements, but he needs to do so before the end of the upcoming summer. It's a simple narrative trick, but it's one that works. This episode also has us meeting Roku for the first time, which was pretty neat as well. This episode didn't have much on the front of character development, but it did have a cool Sokka moment. Over the series, we see Sokka develop a great strategic mind. Here we see that for the first time with him trying to open this door. His plan didn't work, but it's the beginning of this arc for Sokka. Besides that, there wasn't much character development, but there was some pretty neat world building. The concept of these fire sages and losing their way except for one of them was a concept I quite liked. It shows us how the war has perverted people's minds over the century, but also how not everyone in the Fire Nation is the same. Overall, this episode has some neat action and expanded the world. Nothing special, but nothing bad here either. Number 40, Winter Solstice Part 1. This is the first episode that delves into spirits and the spirit world, and it did a pretty good job. What I like the most about this episode is Aang struggling with his role as the Avatar. A lot of times when there's a chosen one, they always just have the answers. But with Aang, he openly admits he has no clue what he's doing. This episode doesn't make Aang feel like a chosen one. It makes him feel like an ordinary kid who happened to be born with special powers. And that's something I appreciated. Now, Aang does kind of learn his lesson here quite quickly. He just sees the spirit is secretly a panda and is able to conclude that the panda is a spirit that is angry about the forest, but I don't entirely mind that because it shows Aang's ability to be empathetic. The other half of this episode is Iroh getting captured and Zuko saving him. There's not much here, but I kinda liked it because it highlighted the bond between Zuko and Iroh. The moment where Zuko sees Appa but decides to go save Iroh anyway was a solid character moment. It shows that there's more to Zuko than just finding the Avatar. He's a real person who has attachments to others. Overall, Overall, this was a solid episode that had some pretty nice stuff in it, but nothing great, I would say. Number 39, The Waterbending Scroll. I feel like a lot of people would have this episode a bit lower on their list, but I don't know, I kinda really enjoyed it. In this episode, Katara wants to improve her waterbending, and she gets frustrated with Aang that he is so much more naturally gifted than she is. Some may find that annoying, but to me it humanizes Katara. If I was more disciplined than someone, but they were more gifted, then yeah, I would get a little annoyed. It's only human nature. Showing a character is flawed is just as important as progressing them along their arcs, so I appreciated that about this episode. Other than that, this episode doesn't have too much relevance to the rest of the season, but I still really enjoyed it. The banter between Zuko and Iroh is hilarious in this episode. Something about Iroh wanting to dock his boat just for a lotus tile was so funny. Also, seeing the back and forth between the gang, Zuko, and the pirates was entertaining. We all know that Avatar excels at depicting bending fights, but it also does a great job with action that isn't strictly bending versus bending. Here we have these pirates that throw these smoke bombs and fight with swords. It allows the action in the show to always be fresh with lots of variety. This is one of those episodes that kinda doesn't follow the typical boring Goldman checklist for a good episode, but because it was entertaining and fun, I really liked it. Number 38, The Chase. This episode is the first time we really get to see Toph interact with the crew, and it's quite entertaining. I love how different Toph and Katara are and how they bicker a lot. It makes the episodes where the two become so close that much nicer. I wouldn't say this episode had any big character development or anything, but it did have some nice moments between the characters. I already mentioned Toph and Katara, but the interaction that was my favorite was between Toph and Iroh. This season is the season where Iroh really steps it up with his motivational quotes. Here he tells Toph that there's nothing wrong with people helping 
helping you. It's a solid lesson that inspires Toph to go back and help her new friends. This episode, we also get a bit more of Azula. I liked seeing her interactions at the end of the episode, especially when she faked surrendered and then attacked Iroh. It was a revealing moment for her character. Overall, again, there wasn't much to this episode, but it did have a fun premise and I enjoyed it. Number 37, The Ember Island Players. This might be the episode that is the most fun. So the crew goes to see a play about pretty much the entire events of Avatar The Last Airbender, and it's hilarious. Now with this episode, you need to accept the fact that these Fire Nation writers somehow had access to scenes and moments that were strictly between characters we already know. I know in the beginning of the play they listed how they got accounts of all this information, but it's still totally unrealistic. Once you accept that, seeing our main characters react to the stage versions of themselves was great. But I love how this episode also allows our characters to reflect. Like after Zuko portrays Iroh in the play, Zuko uses that time to reflect on everything and how guilty he feels. It's not as important, but we see Aang and Katara address the kiss at the invasion for the first time and how they both feel. It's a really neat moment. Now the reason this episode isn't higher is because at the end of the day, it's still just a recap episode. Nothing happens here that is important at all. So even though the episode was certainly entertaining, I can't put it too much higher on my list. Number 36, Sokka's Master. I really love this episode for Sokka. It begins with the main crew putting out a big fire from a meteor, and Sokka just sits there because there is nothing for him really to do. He then gets upset because he feels less important than everyone. I love that the show finally addressed these feelings that Sokka has because realistically being a bender is such a natural advantage in life. For those who aren't benders, there must be resentment towards those who are benders. Sokka doesn't show resentment or anything, but it's an interesting topic to explore in this world. Sokka inevitably finds a master who wants to teach him how to sword fight. What I love about this episode is what it said about Sokka. Sokka doesn't become important to the story because he's decent with the sword. He's important because of his leadership and his personality. He doesn't need to be a powerful bender to be important, and that's the theme of this episode. Now at the end of the day, this episode is still pretty much a side episode. It doesn't advance the plot in any meaningful way. But of all the side episodes in the series, this has to be one of the better ones. Number 35, The Drill. This episode was all about destroying the giant drill, and the whole battle sequence was really well done. I like battles that take multiple stages to win. Instead of just fighting a bunch of soldiers and then doing one special move to destroy the drill, the team works together to destroy it. First they enter the drill, and then they start cutting all the posts on the inside. I found that to be a creative way to have this battle conclude. Also the fight between Aang and Azula on the top of the drill was really well done. So overall this episode has some really good action and a good battle sequence. Besides that though, there wasn't anything else too memorable. I mean, at the end of the day, it is just an episode devoted to a whole battle. There was no character moments that really shine through in the episode, and I guess that's why the episode isn't ranked higher. It had great action, but not much character work. Number 34, The Cave of Two Lovers. This episode is iconic for its secret tunnel song. I'll give the episode this, it was a genuinely funny episode. There's a lot of well-timed humor in the episode. Some highlights are Iroh deciding if he should eat the plants and Aang's comments about kissing Katara. Also the hippies back and forth with Sokka was great. One aspect of this episode I quite liked was the world building with the two lovers. This episode could have easily just been our gang traveling through a cave and fighting monsters. So I like that they wanted to add the element of the two lovers story. Something about this cave being magical where if you trust in love they will let you out was a neat way to expand the world. The other half of the episode followed Iroh and Zuko, and there was more here than just some funny moments with Iroh. Zuko's story in season 2 is all about exposing him to the real world. In order to go on that redemption arc, he needs to feel the impacts of the war on innocent people. I like the moments where this girl tells Zuko her dad died in the war, and where she shows him her scar. Zuko doesn't turn good right away, but it's one more building block that prepares Zuko for his redemption. For an episode that could have easily been filler, it did a decent amount quite well, and I really enjoyed it. Number 33, The Desert. This episode is mostly just our characters finding their way out of the desert after losing Appa. But where the episode really shines for me are with the characters. With Toph unable to see, Aang in emotional disarray, and Sokka being high as a kite, Katara takes it upon herself to keep the group together. This episode did a great job at showing why Katara is the emotional glue that keeps the group together. Because while Aang is the avatar, he's not really the leader of the group. Each member of the group excels at something, and that's what makes them all feel like equals. Sokka is not 
not a bender, but he is a good leader and develops a good eye for strategy as the series progresses. Katara is not the most powerful bender of the group, but as I said before, she's kind of the emotional glue. So this episode just reinforced something about the show I already loved. I also really liked seeing Aang in this state. Sure, Aang has faced emotional turmoil in the series, but losing Appa is what hits him the hardest, and seeing him struggle with that only further humanizes the character. The moment at the end where he enters the Avatar state was his breaking point, and it was powerful to watch. This episode does follow Zuko and Iroh a bit as well. There isn't any character work with these two in the episode, but there is a bit of world building here with the introduction of the White Lotus, so that was pretty cool. While this episode had a pretty generic plot, it does have some solid character development and other really powerful moments. Number 32, The Earth King. So this episode has us meeting the Earth King for the first time, and it was pretty cool. I like how goofy the Earth King is. It added some levity to the episode, and I quite like that. Maybe the best part for me was the action in the beginning of the episode. Seeing the gang storm the Earth Palace and force their way in to see the king was awesome. It's not often we see the gang fight as a complete unit, so seeing it here was awesome. I can't get it out of my head that these are a group of kids that are taking out the Earth King's most skilled soldiers so easily. I don't know if that's a criticism or not, but it's certainly an observation. The second half of this episode was just okay. The gang pretty much just tries their best to convince the Earth King that the war is real. The episode ends setting up the two-part finale, and it does a good job there. Overall, this was a fine episode. It had some really great action and a few moments of levity as well. Number 31, The Boy in the Iceberg. Here we have the pilot episode, and man is this a good one. What I love about this episode is how it focuses almost entirely on character and not so much the plot. We are introduced to five of our main characters, Aang, Katara, Sokka, Zuko, and Iroh. In the little screen time each character has, we learn so much about their personalities. Each character has multiple moments to show what kind of person they are. The episode also does a surprisingly decent job at introducing us to bending in such a short time. Certain characters can manipulate water, air, and fire. Some see it as a part of their culture, and others see it as a lost art. Also, the opening monologue from Katara does a good job of telling us what we need to know, again, in a short amount of time. There are four elements, the Fire Nation is at war with the other three, and there's only one person who can bend to each element. Simple, but effective. I also love the mysteries that this episode sets up. What happened to the airbenders? Why do people say they are extinct? It's a good way to tease the episodes to come. My only criticism of this episode is that it has some juvenile humor that is thankfully dropped as the series progresses. Like, you don't see many booger jokes anymore. Overall, this was a fairly strong pilot for the series. It focused almost entirely on character, and that is important if audiences are going to be invested in the rest of the series. Before I continue on with the rest of this video, only 5.4% of my viewers are subscribed to this channel. So if you're enjoying this video, please consider subscribing for more content like this. Thank you. Number 30, The Waterbending Master. This episode has a lot of cool stuff in it. For one, the world building of the Northern Water Tribe was perfect. Just like Omashu with earthbending, I loved seeing how the Northern Water Tribe used waterbending as a key part of the city's economy. Opening the doors and moving through the city, stuff like that just makes the world feel more real. Also, the whole part about the customs and traditions also adds to the realness of this place. Outside the world building, this was really a Katara-focused episode, and I loved it. Katara may be a caring, kind, and optimistic person, but when she needs to be, she can be tough. I found her determination to stand up for herself and to fight Paku to be an admirable trait from her. I love the line where she tells Aang she's not doing it for him, but she's doing it for herself. Moments like that give a character agency and depth, and that's important. As you guys know, I'm not a big fan of the UI stuff. Her interest in Sokka feels a bit rushed, but that's not a big part of the episode. While there wasn't really any action besides the training, I did like seeing the advanced forms of waterbending. We hadn't seen other waterbenders at this point, so seeing all the new forms of techniques was cool. This was a pretty solid episode that leads nicely into the siege. Number 29, Lake Laogai. This episode further explores the Dai Li, and it's pretty cool. We get more of a glimpse of the brainwashing that is done, and it's pretty creepy, but well done. My favorite part of this episode is the stuff with Zuko. I love this speech that Iroh gives Zuko about asking himself the big questions. All season, Iroh has been giving quotes that are absolute bangers, and this one may be the one that resonates with me the most. The other part of this episode follows the gang and them reuniting with Jet, and some of the stuff is fine. I'll be honest, I think Toph being able to tell if someone is lying is a bit 
it's OP. Like sure, I get she can feel vibrations, but I just think this crosses the line for me. Also, they figure out that Jet was brainwashed way too easily. But besides those criticisms, I thought the action during the fight scenes with the Dai Li was great. Season 2 continues to keep its A game when it comes to the action. The episode ends with the gang finding Appa, and it's a touching moment for sure. Overall, this episode was pretty good. I have a few criticisms, but most of the episode worked for me. Number 28, The Avatar and the Fire Lord. This episode is pretty much just 20 minutes of exposition. Both Aang and Zuko hear the tales of Sozin and Roku. This is the first time that Avatar has done this, an episode that is pretty much all about exposition, and I think it did a pretty good job. For one, the backstory for both these characters was interesting. Seeing why Sozin started the war and how Roku tried to stop him adds a lot of layers to the beginning of the war. Also, the part where we see Roku's death and how Sozin could have helped him but didn't was really fascinating. I guess that's all I can say about this episode, though. The backstory for the characters were really interesting. I get how the stories are applicable to both Zuko and Aang, and it's neat to see how close they become at the end of the series. So yeah, this episode was cool. I've always loved the world building of this show, and this episode did a pretty good job at expanding that. Number 27, Sozin's Comet Part 1. I may get criticized for splitting each part of Sozin's Comet into an episode on this list, but as I said before, if it has its own distinct chapter number, then it gets its own spot on the list. What this episode does is pretty much set up all tension for the four-part finale. The episode establishes why it is important to stop Ozai before the Comet, because Ozai plans on destroying the entire Earth Kingdom. Aang disappears, which also sets up another bit of tension, and now our crew has to find him. But of course, the biggest thing about this episode was Aang refusing to kill Ozai. One complaint I do have is that this philosophy of Aang's I feel was brought up a little too late. It's really my only criticism of this finale. Like, why didn't Aang have this struggle during the invasion? What would his plan have been there? Now, considering the four-part finale is four episodes that add up to a little over an hour, it's essentially a mini-movie. So this episode does a good job of having momentum going into the rest of the finale. Number 26, The Blue Spirit. This episode for me may have the best action up to this point in the series. The entire escape sequence was really cool. I appreciate how Zuko goes the whole episode mostly using his swords. It's another example of the series having diverse fight sequences. I also love the music that plays here. I don't talk about the soundtrack of Avatar that much, but here it is really cool. Now other than the action, I love what this episode does for Zuko. So Aang gets captured and is going to be returned to the Fire Lord. Zuko knows this and arguably decides to risk his life to free Aang so he he can be the one to capture him. The reason I say risk his life is because if Zuko was caught freeing the Avatar, he would almost certainly be executed. When Zuko tells Ozai in Season 3 he will join the Avatar, Ozai tries to kill him. So yes, Zuko is risking his life here. This episode shows to us how important it is for Zuko to restore his honor, which makes him breaking it later on that much more powerful. The episode doesn't do much for our main gang, but I do like the moment where Aang decides to save Zuko and then their little conversation at the end. I think this is one of the earliest examples of Seeds being planted for Zuko's redemption. Overall, this was a really fun episode to watch and had some really solid character work as well. Number 25, The Southern Air Temple. This was a really good episode for character development. Now that I think about it, I feel like I'm going to say this about a lot of the episodes. So Aang returns home to learn that all the airbenders are gone. We see Katara's mothering nature kick in when she tries to protect Aang from the truth about what happened, but of course Aang finds out and eventually he enters the Avatar state. What the show does excellently is convey really dark themes in a way that younger audiences can understand. This episode is about the confirmation of a genocide, but it's conveyed well enough for the younger viewers. While the moment where Aang finds out about the airbenders is a powerful one, it's actually Zuko's story that was the highlight of the episode for me. We learn in this episode that he is a banished prince, which adds a personal element to his quest to find the Avatar, so he can return home. I also love how this early in the series, Zuko continues to show his honor even though he is the main villain, and that's through his Agni Kai against Zhao. Every time Zuko is in an Agni Kai, he shows honor, something he didn't learn until the end of the series. If anything, this episode sets Zuko up as a co-protagonist rather than a villain, and I love that about this show. On the downside, the fight against Zhao was not well done. Considering the bar for fights is set so high in this series, I kinda expect more than what we got here. Overall, this is a really solid episode with a handful of powerful character beats. Number 24, The Headband. <laughs> 
This episode was actually a lot of fun. With the gang setting into the Fire Nation, Aang decides to go to school to learn more about the Fire Nation. For one, the world building in this episode is really great. You get to see how the children of the Fire Nation live and what lessons they are taught. The moment where the teacher asks a question about the Air Navy was played off as a joke, but in reality, it's a pretty dark moment that depicts how propaganda is spread. Outside of that, I loved seeing Aang spread his energy to the Fire Nation kids. The entire sequence of him dancing and helping others learn how to dance is is one of the reasons I love Aang so much. He's a real person and has flaws, but he has such an infectious energy to him. But it was certainly enjoyable. This episode is also sprinkled with moments with Zuko visiting Iroh. It was painful to watch knowing how close the two had grown in season two, but also shows us how Zuko is spiraling a bit. Even though Zuko doesn't do much in the first half of season three, it does a great job illustrating to us why he would change. So even though nothing plot related happens here, it's a great episode for character. Number 23, Nightmares and Daydreams. This episode was really refreshing to me. I can't remember a time I've seen a show or movie depict this level of nerves before a major battle. Like sure, sometimes we see people say they're scared, but not to this level. Seeing Aang stress about the invasion days before was so relatable. I've had similar nightmares about failing a test in school. I couldn't imagine having to fight a battle. So the realism of the anxiety Aang was dealing with was my favorite part of this episode. Besides that, the episode is also quite funny. The gag of Appa and Momo fighting might be one of my favorites in the series. Something about seeing them talk always gives me a good laugh. I also really liked how juvenile Aang's dreams were, like with him losing his pants. It's a reminder that Aang is just a kid. This episode had some Zuko stuff too, which was solid character work, but overall it's what this episode did for Aang that really made me enjoy it. Number 22, The Avatar State. This was a really good start to season two. So the two main points about this episode are fleshing out the Avatar state and establishing Azula. Starting with the former, I love the way they contextualize the Avatar state. One of the most important lessons of world building is that it's not what your powers can do, but it's more important what they can't do. Having the Avatar state being triggered when Aang is under duress is a great way to limit his power because the end of season one did establish that when Aang is in the Avatar state, he's pretty much unstoppable. I also love the thought process of the general. After the season 1 finale, I would be thinking the same thing as him. Why wait to defeat the Fire Lord when you can just go into the Avatar state right now? It's another realistic question and I'm glad it was addressed. The other half of the episode introduced Azula, and man did they do a good job. Right away we see what kind of villain she is. She is nothing like Zuko, she's clearly an evil person in a way Zuko isn't, and she will be a force to be reckoned with going forward. For an episode that doesn't have any major battles or anything, it was a great start to season 2. Number 21, The Guru. This episode is the penultimate episode of season two, and pretty much everything it does is set up the finale. A big portion of the episode is Aang getting his training from this guru, and a lot of it is an interesting look inside another aspect of the series, and that's the energy within people. The storyline ends with Aang seeing that Katara is in trouble and leaving to go rescue her. I do find that to be a bit convenient, that Aang could just dig deep and see Katara was in trouble. It would have been really useful if he could have done that while Appa was gone, but the other parts of this episode I liked a lot more more. Sokka gets to reunite with his dad and those moments are so wholesome. I love seeing Sokka hear how proud his dad is of him. It's so rewarding for the character. Toph learns metal bending in this episode, which was pretty cool. Seeing Azula infiltrate the Dai Li and plan her coup of the Earth King was probably my favorite part of the episode. Again, a lot of this episode is just set up for the finale, so there are no big payoffs here. But as an episode that is pretty much all set up, it does it all brilliantly. Number 20, The Serpent's Pass. This episode has a lot to love. On the character development front, we get some good moments with Sokka and Aang. Sokka is shown to still be struggling with the death of Yue, and his interactions with Suki reflect that. It makes it feel like everything along their journey was important, which it realistically would be. With Aang, he is still struggling with the loss of Appa. While he's a bit more positive than the last episode, he is still clearly struggling. I love at the end of the episode where the newborn baby gives Aang his hope back. It's a great moment that reminds us that sometimes the littlest thing can bring us back to who we are. This episode also showcases the return of Suki and Jet. I liked both their episodes in season 1, especially the Jet episode, so I was glad to see them return here. Despite the character work being really solid, I think my favorite aspect of this episode was the world building. Again, Avatar manages to introduce rather dark topics like refugees and extreme poverty into this show. Seeing all these people displaced from the war is a reminder of how the ordinary person is affected by it, not just our main heroes. This episode had a mix of everything. It had good character work, it had good world building, and it had some pretty funny moments too. 
Number 19, The Firebending Masters. This episode contains maybe the best look at firebending we will get in the entire series, and I love it. So the episode begins with Zuko struggling to firebend, so he and Aang decide to go to the ancient Sun Warrior Temple to study the original firebenders. Just the concept of this place alone adds so many layers to the world. I love the idea of these secret firebenders who don't associate at all with the Fire Nation. These secret subcultures like the Swampbenders make the world feel real. When Zuko and Aang meet the dragons, the display of the fire was simply beautiful. One of the better visual shots of the series. Another reason I liked this episode outside the really cool world building was seeing Aang and Zuko interact. The writers understood that in order for Zuko to feel like a member of Team Avatar, he needs to bond with each person in the group. So having an episode where Zuko and Aang get to banter with each other was a lot of fun. These Zuko adventure episodes are some of my favorite in the series, and the Firebending Masters, with all its great world building, is no exception. Exception. Number 18, City of Walls and Secrets. I absolutely love the world building in this episode. So for the first time in the series, we get a good look at Ba Sing Se, and I love how many real world elements they included here. So first we have the areas that divide the city by class. Sure, there may not be many cities that have actual walls that divide the wealthy and the poor, but the idea of these areas that do separate class is realistic. Along with that, we have the propaganda that the Dai Li pushes. They do the best to keep any mention of the war out from the city. They want to maintain peace and not have anyone worry about the war. The suppression of information like this is more common than some may realize. Also, using the Earth King as a figurehead is another neat idea. There are so many layers to the city that is Ba Sing Se, and all this is accomplished in one episode. Besides that, there are some funny character moments, like with the gang going to the party. I also enjoyed seeing Zuko and Iroh just live life as waiters at a tea shop. It's such an important part of Zuko's arc. This episode had so much to love. It had nice character moments, but it was the world building of Ba Sing Se that makes this episode stand out. Number 17, The Puppet Master. This episode was a banger. Way earlier in the video, I mentioned that the first half of season three was just a bunch of side episodes. And besides the beach, I think this one is the best. It's another Katara-focused episode, and we see her mirrored through Hama. In a lot of ways, this episode reminds me of the Jet episode in season one. We see how the Fire Nation has tortured people and turned them into monsters of their own. The backstory of how Hama was imprisoned and being forced to survive was a haunting story. What makes Katara moral is that she will not become like the enemy. And we see that in her fight with Hama. A fight, mind you, that was excellently choreographed. New forms of bending like combustion bending or blood bending I find to be so interesting, and the inclusion of blood bending in this episode was a brilliant one. While the beginning of season 3 has a lot of great character work, I think what this episode does for Katara makes it one of the better ones. Number 16, Bitter Work. This is the episode where both Aang and Zuko get some training, and it's really well done. Aang for the first time is learning earthbending, and I love how the show made this difficult for him. The idea of an avatar struggling with the opposite of their natural element is a really cool idea that adds more layers to the world. The way Toph teaches Aang was another excellent display of her personality. What makes Team Avatar so endearing is not just the relationship each character has with each other, but that they're all so different from one another. After getting to know Aang, Sokka, and Katara for a whole season, Season, adding Toph and her headstrong personality was a great inclusion. So with Aang, I really enjoyed all his training sequences and how he was able to learn his first bit of earthbending. The other half of this episode is where Iroh teaches Zuko about lightning. And man, Iroh has some great words of wisdom here. His lesson about studying all the elements to make you a more balanced person is a lesson that is so true. This can apply to anything, not just bending. The way Iroh described how he learned lightning redirection was so Iroh, and it makes the bending feel more realistic. Zuko in this episode reaches rock bottom. The way he yells at the weather at the end of the episode could have been goofy, but it was surprisingly powerful. This episode had a lot of great moments, but the highlights for me was Aang's training and Iroh's new lessons. Number 15, The Avatar Returns. The second episode of the series is a great compliment to the pilot, but I think I like it a little bit better. Where episode 1 highlighted all of the main characters' personalities, this episode showed us some real character. We see through the actions of many of the characters what kind of people they truly are. Aang is always trying to make peace where he can, whether it be leaving the Water Tribe, going back to help them, or turning himself in. He is always trying to maintain peace. With Sokka, while he is quite clumsy and goofy, we see he has no fear of trying to take on the entire Fire Nation 
friendship on his own. And with Zuko, while he is the clear villain of the series at this point, he does show some honor by accepting Aang's offer of leaving the Water Tribe alone. Zuko is also always ready to fight Aang himself, instead of relying on his henchmen to do it for him. What this episode also does is put the world building on hold and really give us some solid action. The first episode didn't have any fighting, so here we get to see what a bending fight is really like. This is a compliment to the series as a whole rather than just this episode, but the choreography of the fights are so smooth and fluid. Overall, this was a great second episode and did a nice job following up episode 1. Number 14, Appa's Lost Days. I completely forgot how good this episode is. It's usually a tough one for me to watch because seeing animals suffer is quite hard, but that's the point of this episode. This episode does a fantastic job at putting Appa in the forefront and making us empathize with him. The first half of the episode explores animal cruelty and the circus industry. It did a surprisingly good job at conveying its message without being too preachy. We see the tactics these people use to abuse and manipulate animals. It's tough to watch, but it's realistic. Sure, it's quite convenient that the Kyoshi Warriors found Appa, but the brief encounter here actually pays off in Season 3, so I like its inclusion. The episode ends with Appa meeting Guru Patik and then getting captured by the Dai Li. I enjoyed how this episode gave us an update on Appa, but didn't resolve the conflict of him being lost. It keeps momentum for the rest of the season by wondering where he is now. Overall, this episode definitely accomplished its goal of getting us to feel for Appa, and for that reason, it's a great episode. Number 13, The Southern Raiders. This was one of my favorite side episodes of the show. This is the third episode of the Zuko Adventures series, and this time he takes a trip with Katara to find the man who killed Katara and Sokka's mother. What I love about this episode is how human Katara is. All series we see how compassionate she is, how she's always the one trying to keep everyone together. But once she learns she can find the man who killed her mother, she turns to the dark side for a bit, even using bloodbending on this one Fire Nation soldier. The part of the episode I like the best is when they do find the former leader of the Southern Raiders. I love how the sequence is filmed. I like how it takes the perspective of this man and how he's kind of this pathetic old person. The scene frames him in the victim role. This allows the audience to see what Katara sees when she decides to spare him. It was a powerful moment, and I like how Katara said she didn't forgive him. It's easier said than done, but not everyone can forgive. It was a wonderfully written episode, and one of the better side episodes of the series. Number 12, The Beach. This might be the best side episode in the entire series. A small part of this episode has to do with the combustion bender attacking the gang. Even though it is a small part, the introduction of this kind of bending was awesome. It also made for some pretty cool action sequences. But the majority of this episode is devoted to the Fire Nation kids, and almost everything here is perfect. Something about seeing all of them, especially Azula, in a normal setting was so refreshing. Azula's awkwardness around other kids was so entertaining to watch, but it also subtly conveys the dark themes of how these children are being destroyed by war. Azula is incapable of acting like a normal teenage girl. Towards the end of the episode, they all gather around a fire and spew out some of their deepest feelings, and it's a great moment for each of the four characters. Mei and Tai Li are supporting characters, but they still get development. And of course, it expands Zuko and Azula even further. I love this episode. It has good action, it tackles some pretty serious themes, and it's also hilarious at times, especially with Zuko and Mei. Number 11, The Blind Bandit. This episode is entirely devoted to introducing Toph, and it did so perfectly on every front, is that it not only perfectly conveyed Toph's personality, but also gave us a deeper appreciation for earthbending. I've always compared Toph's introduction to Avatar with Yoda's introduction to Star Wars. With Yoda, it was taught that it didn't matter how physically strong you were, faith in the Force is stronger than anything. With Avatar, Toph's introduction taught us the same thing with bending. Also, the way the show used Toph's blindness to explain why she is such a strong bender was brilliant. Now, when it comes to Toph's character, I mean, what can I say? The episode showed us how headstrong she is, how confident she is, but also how vulnerable she is. Her desire to be independent is a big part of her character, and I love that Avatar introduced us to that part of Toph right in her first episode. This episode was brilliant. It showed us who Toph was, it did some pretty good world building for earthbending, and it even had some pretty cool action too. Number 10, Jet. 
This episode is another example of Avatar bringing real world concepts into the show and adapting them for kids. So Jet and his rebels are freedom fighters who have been radicalized. They are willing to do anything to hurt the Fire Nation, and that includes the innocents. What this episode teaches us is how war affects different people. Sokka and Katara were able to keep a moral compass through their tragedy, but Jet was not. Even those who may be on the good side can still be evil. I'm not sure I would say Jet is an evil person, but he clearly has a bit of a dark side in him. Sometimes war turns you into the very thing you want to destroy. You forget why you are fighting a war in the first place, and you lose yourself in your quest to win. So those are all the reasons why I love Jet and his inclusion in the series. Another reason this episode is great is because of Sokka's development. Sokka's arc is about becoming a leader, and while Jet is undeniably a good leader, he's leading his group down a dark path. Sokka needs to see firsthand the importance of leading for the right reasons. There's an ongoing joke about his instincts throughout this episode episode, but it teaches an important lesson about not betraying your instincts either. It was Sokka's instincts that saved the town, so I loved what this episode did for Sokka. I also like how the team didn't entirely win. Sure, they saved the people of this village, but they didn't save the village itself. Showing Team Avatar not getting a complete win every time is important. I really like this episode, and it is certainly one of the best of Season 1. Number 9. Sozin's Comet Part 2 there's a lot to love in this episode. Seeing Aang talk to some of his past lives was really neat. I liked how each one basically told Aang the same thing, that he needs to kill the Fire Lord. What makes this so great is because when Aang inevitably does decide not to kill Ozai, it sets him apart from the rest and shows us what kind of person Aang is. The other part of this episode is the rest of the crew finding Iroh, and along the way they run into the White Lotus. I love how a handful of these characters that we met throughout the series come back for the finale. It's not quite the Avengers Endgame team up scene, but it's pretty dark darn cool seeing everyone again. Easily the best part of this episode is when Zuko reunites with Iroh. There's just something about how harsh Zuko is on himself that makes my heart swell. We know Iroh could never be mad at Zuko, but seeing Zuko think Iroh would hate him and then having Iroh hug him was such a beautiful moment. It also makes me tear up each time. And then when Iroh tells Zuko he has unquestionable honor, it's so heartwarming to hear that knowing how he began the series. And then the episode ends with the gang learning what their roles are. It sets up the final battle so so nicely. This was a really good episode that leads into the final two episodes perfectly. Number 8. The Storm this episode has some of the best character development in the series. Sure, there's an ongoing plot about a storm and Sokka getting stuck at sea, but that isn't too important. For Aang, we finally learned the reason why he was in the iceberg, because the nomads were going to send him away. What I love about this is how fair it is to Aang. He's a 12-year-old kid, and he's all of a sudden bombarded with this responsibility that he has to be the Avatar. People are treating him differently, and he's going to be separated from his guardian. You can't blame a 12-year-old kid for acting this way when the whole world is a about to change. But regardless, he still holds guilt from that and from what happened to his people. Aang inevitably learns to forgive himself and he's ready to move on. It's such a great backstory to give Aang. The other half of the episode is devoted to fleshing out Zuko, and I would argue that this part was more important. Even though Zuko is the villain, the show makes every attempt at treating him like he is his own protagonist. We learn how he got his scar, and it's from a moment where Zuko showed honor. It was his concern for innocent Fire Nation soldiers that ultimately led to his banishment. It was a genius decision to have Zuko acting honorably lead to his banishment, because it's such a fundamental part of his redemption arc. This episode did a perfect job at fleshing out arguably its two most important characters, and for that reason, it is one of the best episodes in the series. Number 7. Zuko Alone God, this episode is so damn good. Besides maybe the storm, this episode fleshes out Zuko more than any other. The main plot of this episode is Zuko helping out a random family from the Earth Kingdom, while the B-plot is a handful of flashbacks that show Zuko's childhood. What this episode does is show us what Zuko was like before he got banished. He was a good kid who unfortunately was bullied by his sister and neglected by his father. Of course Ozai would love Azula more. She is the more gifted firebender. What's maybe more important, however, is showing Zuko's mother's influence on him. She was the angel on his shoulder, and when she disappeared, that's when gaining Ozai's approval is all that mattered to Zuko. I also love how the episode intercuts Zuko's past with the Earth Kingdom family he is helping. Season 2 is all about exposing Zuko to the real world, and here he gets another piece of that as he sees how this innocent town views the Fire Nation. They see Zuko as evil and a monster just for being a firebender, even though Zuko saved him. As much as the main plot of this episode works, it's the flashbacks that truly give the episode the depth it 
needed. Zuko's past is essential in understanding who he is, and this episode does a brilliant job at conveying that. Number 6. The Tales of Ba Sing Se Considering this episode should have been a filler episode, what it manages to accomplish is nothing short of spectacular. Right off the bat, we all know that Iroh's Tale has some of the best storytelling in the franchise. Every time I watch it, I get emotional, and I could talk about it for hours. What I love about this episode is that each tale is actually quite good. Even the ones that don't really matter like Sokka's or Momo's are pretty entertaining. Zuko's Tale is hilarious because seeing him awkward with a girl is just so Zuko. It also continues to humanize the character. Aang's Tale is great because it shows shows us more of his love for animals. Aang's empathy is one of his most endearing qualities, and that is on full display here. Toph's and Katara's tale is criminally underrated because it gives us a great look at Toph. Seeing her reaction to those other girls was a great bit of storytelling. It shows some of Toph's personality along with her insecurities, and Katara being there for her was great as well. Every moment of this episode either has some of the best storytelling in the series, or is just simply entertaining, and that's why this episode is so high on my list. Number 5. Day of the Black Sun Part 1 what I love so much about the Black Sun invasion is that it feels like a real battle. The battles I love watching are the battles that have a clear strategy behind them, instead of just mindless action that looks cool. During the first half of this two-parter, we get a clear strategy. The entire plan is laid out, and then the first part is executed with the team landing on the shores of the Fire Nation. The action itself is good as always, but again, what makes me really love the battle is the strategy on both sides. Now while the battle was certainly entertaining, what puts these episodes near the top of my list are the character moments. We get this moment with Sokka where he initially fumbles being a leader, but then we see him take charge. Even though they do inevitably lose the battle, this episode is really the culmination of Sokka's character arc. He becomes a leader, his strategy shines through, and he doesn't back down in the face of fear. I love that about Sokka in this episode. I also love seeing how much Aang has matured. He finally makes his move on Katara and he flies right into the main palace. Overall, this episode is not only a great setup for part 2, but it has a lot of moments that allow this episode to stand on its own. And speaking of part two, number four, Day of the Black Sun, part two. Everything I loved about Part 1 is present in Part 2. The strategy behind the battle is still there, but I liked how our gang had to adapt. When the initial plan clearly wasn't working, they improvised and still thought of a plan to potentially win the day. There are plenty of great moments with Sokka, Katara, Aang, and the rest of the group, but of course I need to highlight Zuko in this episode. This is the culmination of his arc, and frankly the culmination of one of the best redemption arcs I have ever seen. It's not just that he decided to turn good. The way he stands up to his father is truly inspiring. When he called out Oz for being cruel and that it's not a form of love, that moment hit harder to me than him saying he would join the Avatar. In some ways, his arc is just as much about him realizing he's a victim of abuse, and the way he uses the lightning redirection taught to him by Iroh was the perfect way to encapsulate this scene. This may be my favorite scene in the show. It's a tough one. To wrap up this episode, we see our characters lose. This invasion that they planned almost a full season ago was a failure, and seeing our characters have to deal with that was so mature for this show. It had everything from action to character to surprise. It is the gold standard furry battle sequence. Number 3. Sozin's Comet Part 3 this is it! This is when Aang finally faces the Fire Lord. After being set up for three full seasons, the two finally go face to face and fight. There's just something about the shot where Aang looks upon Ozai that's so powerful. And then when the two finally chat and begin fighting, it feels like the payoff of everything in this series. I'm glad the storytellers treat this fight with the gravity it deserves. Not to mention that the action here is beautifully choreographed. I love seeing these two fight and all the different attacks Aang has with all his bending. It's hard to put into words really. Because the series did the legwork, it just has so much weight. The other part of this episode is Zuko fighting Azula, and just like Aang vs Ozai, this fight has so much build up too. I love how earlier in the episode we progressively see Azula lose her mind. It was wonderfully set up a few episodes ago, and here it is paid off. In short, this episode is pretty much all action, but it works because of everything that has led up to this moment. Number 2. Sozin's Comet Part 4 what is there to say that hasn't been said? This show ended pretty much perfectly. Sure, I wish bending removal was something that was established way earlier in the show, but I can look past it when everything else was so great. Throughout this video, I spoke about how certain story beats were so powerful because of the setup behind it, but if I had to choose the single moment that I feel is the climax of the whole series, it would be Aang being in the Avatar state bending all four elements at once. This was established right from episode one, and now it has come full circle when he is facing the Fire Lord. It was perfect. 
perfect. The resolution at the end was so touching. I've always believed that Zuko was a co-protagonist along with Aang, so seeing the two of them stand together at the end of the war was again so touching. When shows end and you just want to see more, that's when you know you have a winner. This series was lightning in a bottle, and pretty much everything in this episode was the pinnacle of that. Number 1. The Crossroads of Destiny a lot of people throw out the phrase, this is the Empire Strikes Back of their franchise, but I think this episode is one of the few times that it lives up to that comparison. This is the low moment for our characters' journeys, and everything was done perfect. First, we have Zuko's internal struggle. We clearly see that he is not the same person he was in Season 1, but he's also not mature enough yet to fully follow his uncle's wishes. I thought this episode brilliantly set up Zuko's story in Season 3, so I love how they wrapped that up. This episode also showcases Prime Azula, not only in her physical gifts, as a firebender, but also her strategy. The way she's able to manipulate not only the Dai Li, but also Zuko, was like watching a masterclass. This episode, maybe more than anything, highlights how dangerous Azula is. But of course, what makes this episode so great is the ending. In the first episode of the season, we were told that dying in the Avatar state ends the cycle, and this episode ends with that fear almost being realized. The whole plan to get the Earth Kingdom to invade the Fire Nation was a failure, and seeing our characters fail at a season-long goal they had was so monumental. I love this episode, and it is one of the best season finales I have ever seen. And that is the ranking of all 61 episodes of Avatar The Last Airbender. What are your favorite and least favorite episodes of the series? Let me know down below. Thank you everyone so much for watching another one of my videos. Don't forget to unite the Claude Squad, and I will see you guys next time.